continuing our series in everyone's favorite improbable book club. We welcome back to the show, notorious Florida man and podcast host, Greg Carlwood. Greg, how are you doing? Hey, I can't complain, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, no. Thanks for coming back. Thanks for coming back for another top 10 countdown. And I don't know about you. I found this one the most challenging in a way. How did you find it? Well, yeah, I I would agree because I think the healing books, health books, it's a more specific category. It's definitely not exactly my forte. And I included some big pharma-ish, health-ish books in the conspiracy list. So I also didn't want to double up on those. So yeah, I think it's probably been the most challenging, but you know, we're three deep. I mean, these lists are fun to do and we got to get creative with them. Yeah, it's it's weird you say it's not your area, right? Because I think the absolute opposite. You've been in this business of show a few years longer than I have, right? And I have, like many of us, had the privilege of watching THC become what it has become. And I think the core strength of it, it it does all the, you know, the the wild and woolly in there. But you've got a a so-called conspiracy podcast that actually provides actionable intelligence for people when it comes to this holistic understanding of health. That's why I I thought, no, we're going to make Greg push through a so-called alternative health one, although I'll get to the title of the episode in a minute, because it's, I think you really hit your stride as a host and a researcher in that exact area of where the politics of this idiot planet and our health and flourishing collide. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of you to say, I think you're being a bit generous, but It is kind of true that I want conspiracy theorists, I guess, to be better if the alternative counterculture anti-establishment worldview is the right one, then it should show somewhere in the way we live and what better metric than our health. Obviously, the past few years, conspiracy has been all about health. And it's something I wanted to get right. Even when we were just doing childhood vaccines back in the day, it was like, man, I really got to take a hard look at this. This is not just Bigfoot. It's dumb to take my advice as a podcaster, but I know that people hang on every word sometimes, a certain segment of the audience. And I don't want anybody making real life changing decisions based on some interview I did that was just convincing, but not accurate. So I felt a bit of a responsibility to dig in appropriately, and it does filter into so many things. It's like the corporations are really the multi-headed hydra in so many ways, and that's food and big pharma working in conjunction to keep everyone coming back through, you know, sick, feeling like shit, and then getting treatment. And so, yeah, it, it is a huge slice of the conspiracy pie for sure. And I didn't think that when I started necessarily. No one does, right? No one, but we should have. It's one of the things I think that looks obvious in retrospect because it's not, it invites the understanding that the the sort of stuff that's discussed on a conspiracy show, even a magic podcast, well, especially a magic podcast that almost goes without saying, isn't just in the physical, right? So a lot of the beginning let's say, alternative health advice is at the level of the physical, it's nutrition and so on. And then you start to get to the more than physical and go, well, hang on, I'm pretty sure there's some kind of entity situation. There's something like a spirit world, something's going on. And that impacts health as well. Like, And in between the two of them, you have EMF. So it's funny. It's just not funny, haha, but like, wow, why did we not think that? Yeah. <laughs> Ten or so years ago, this is literally where the rubber meets the road because there's a powerful step into sovereignty of going, I refuse. I refuse to let corporations and states tell me what is and isn't healthy. And like the the famous, the last three years, body sovereignty stuff is definitely in play. But I mean, body sovereignty in the level of physical body, mental body, emotional body, spirit body, if you want, like that, they're all yours, right? And they require tending. So it's just an electrifying an endless field because literal field <laughs> in, in both senses of the word, because it's like, this is everything. This is where all the stuff in a show like THC impacts you one way or the other. Yeah, I agree. And it's mm, bound to frustrate some people because there's just so many different ways to look at health and 
everybody's in one camp or another. It's it's got a whole lot of uh, little subcultures, and I think we're overlapping in most of them, almost all of them. I really can't think of a difference just from casual conversation of what we think is a component, yeah. an important component of health. But you know, our audiences are large enough that we will hear about it when we are wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Obviously, and this won't surprise anyone, some of the stuff that's going to actually, I'll move to the title slides where we talk about our theories of, of inclusion, which is, yeah. I'm going to ask you your metaphysics of what went into your list. Because when we did this for conspiracy books and UFOs, there was a thinking in the selection of books that goes into the most challenging cut. And we're actually allocating time in this episode, a bit more time to make to talk about the long list if only so that we don't have to hear about <laughs> the drama like but, but you didn't bring this book but you didn't pick that book it's ah settle down settle up. right we're, we're going to talk about stress in this episode and you're stressing us both out uh, <laughs> but one of the things i've noticed now having uh shamanic energy healing clients is the even tabling the idea that a uh, germ like an invisible particle might not be the originator of a particular set of symptoms really inflames people, terrifies them. Mm -hmm. And when I look at the energetics, there's a, there's imprints from being toddler age in there of having their faces wiped and their hands wiped. And this idea of like yucky, yucky. And because for a toddler, that's like, oh my goodness, I'm being like judged and ejected because like I have dirt on me. And so when people responded an 11 out of 10 to the suggestion that terrain theory might have something to say for your health. If that's you listening to this, I want you to consider the possibility that it's emerging from an irrational place. If you come in at an 11 out of 10 rather than a five, it's generally a good indication that you're reacting out of a place of trauma. And it's something that I would not have known, well, certainly not at the beginning of the last three years, because that was the time when I actually went through the training. I would not have known that, but I, when the, some of the flashpoints in a discussion about health inevitably emerge from a place of trauma, which also inevitably must be included in a conversation about health. So however you're here, stick around. That's all I can say. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting when you said it. Clearly, I have a toddler. So when you tell me something like that, I think about like, oh, what is my own behavior in that area? and it's probably similar to most parents. You just can't let your kid be dirty all the time. But yeah, maybe tone down the drama around it. Like it's just because we don't want you to get strawberry hands on the couch. It's not because yeah, strawberries exactly. are going to kill you. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's probably I, something I'm in there. Pretty confident that she's going to grow up in a terrain open house. So I, I think <laughs> I, I don't think that'll be too much of an issue. But I mean, that's just. Uh, Mia, one of the areas, let's talk instead about the philosophy of your inclusion. What made it onto your list of top 10 and why? Sure. Well, the way I usually start is just going to the bookshelf and going to the health section and just kind of pulling out all the good ones, you know, thinking about the ones um, I've done interviews on, the ones I wish I did, what I got in the Kindle form, and then seeing how many that is, which was about, I don't know, 40 or 50. Uh, and then starting to to cut and select from there. And so I would think, well, you know, what are the components to health? I would say, obviously, the best water, the best food, EMF environment, big pharma avoidance, let's say. And I wanted to make sure I had what I thought was the best book for at least the components of health, because I did think, is this actionable? Like I've got some really good books on the didn't quite make it list that are going over the history of the AMA or GMOs or even sane asylums from Jerry Cantor, who we both interviewed, is really interesting. But I don't know what I'm going to do really with that book, Sane Asylums. It's just a chapter of history of homeopathic psychiatry that is interesting. So I kind of thought, what are the 10 books where if I actually took my own advice, if I actually followed the guidelines in these books, I'd be Superman. And for the most part, I think that's the philosophy that drove my list. Nice one. So I kind of took the educated guess that's the direction you would go. There is a lot more put the fork down fatty in your list, which is great. 
because it allowed me to go in a different direction. I kind of went goats only. So for people who haven't played along with uh, one of these book countdown episodes before, I, because I put the slides together, I know Greg's books, counting down to 10, because I had to put the slides together. Uh, so he doesn't know mine, so there'll be some surprises for him, uh, but I know Greg. So I, I, when the list came through, I'm glad I took that guess because I went goats only. I went in that direction you were just talking about of the wider philosophy of health. Because some of the, I mean, we just joked about <laughs> some of the negative or, no, that's not the right word, some of the takes that we get as feedback when we do the book episodes. But to be honest, most of it is from people. First time we did it, the conspiracy one, I got about five emails from people complaining, going, great, I just spent 150 bucks at Amazon, which yeah, is the true. result we want. <laughs> one of the kind of subtexts of doing a double 10 countdown is really there are 20 books. So it's a top 10 list containing 20 books followed by the long list. And it's worked. I think it's worked the best. You won't know this yet. <laughs> I think it's worked the best out of any of these countdowns that we have done. But yeah, so I went goat only and it works really well in tandem. So what do you reckon? You ready to jump on in? I am. Yes. I, I think it's uh, great to have two different philosophies because it's more entertaining to have two different approaches and less overlap. And now we're going to move into the presentation proper and the countdown of our books. And just like the last few times we've done this, I was kind of hoping there was an overall metaphysics behind it. I certainly had one. Mm -hmm. What was yours, Greg? How did you approach pulling this list together? Well, I started by going to the shelf, the health and wellness shelf, and pulling off all the books that I think would qualify, looking through the ebooks I've got, just the general libraries across the board. And I came up with like 50 books, and then I started whittling away. And it's you have to come up with a process at that point, a justification for why some great books aren't on the list. And I just started thinking, well, what are the components of health? Water, structured water, you know, EMF environment, food, avoiding, avoiding big pharma. And I just started thinking, well, what are the best books for these sections, let's say? And what are the best books that if I was able to actually take the advice in the books, I'd be like Superman. And that was kind of the approach is like, do I need to know about the history of the AMA if I'm actually eating the right diet? Not really. Do I need a GMO book if I'm eating the right diet? Not really, because by to, you would just happen to not be eating this, the processed foods that they that aren't in that book. So I kind of whittled away things that are what to not do or you know the history of big pharma and all that stuff and just focused on what are the books that I think taking the advice in would make a person the healthiest. Yeah, I like that. So you actually have some history of big pharma style books in a previous list, right? Like when we did the top 10 conspiracy books for all the right reasons. And I educated guests front run, crossed my fingers that you would do something very actionable, which you have, which is great for people who haven't played along before, because I put the slides together, I get to know Greg's top 10 countdown moving forward, but he doesn't know mine, right? So there's some surprise in there for him as well, because I went in a goats only direction and not exactly the overall metaphysics of it, but just hoping that Greg would come through with the actionable, which he has. And what I was trying to aim for is, yeah, to, to put some, I almost respectability, it's not quite the right word, uh, around some of the claims uh, in the uh, health books. And if you haven't done this before, one of the things that's really fun about the, the book countdowns is, although we talk about people maybe saying negative things, not really, but maybe people uh, freaking out if their book or their topic isn't included, most of the time we get messages like, great, I just spent $150 on Amazon. Thanks for that. Because the top 10 is really 20 plus a long list. It's a discussion of how something like health can hit your life. And that's why it's weird. Like when I was thinking about the title for the episode, if you're watching this uh, on YouTube, you'll see that the first slide, the title slide is called the top 10 true healing books of all time. Because one of the things I really 
rankle over is calling it alternative health. Uh, the alternative is allopathy. It's a 150-year experiment that, for the most part, hasn't gone very well. That's the alternative, right, to yes. the half-million-year history of healing that uh, humans on this planet understand and do. So I'm, go I'm calling it the top 10 true healing books of all time because I think that's the right framing of it. But I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to jump on in. What do you reckon, Greg? Yeah, let's do it. All right. And, of course, if you're listening to this, as most of you are, you're just missing some slides. We're going to tell you what the book titles are. Beginning with 10th place. Greg, what did you go with? I went with the non-tinfoil guide to EMFs, How to Fix Our Stupid Use of Technology by Nick Pino, because it's the most recent EMF book I read. But in it, in just the intro, he makes a great case for, hey, I've read the top 50 books on this. And compiled their information into my book. A lot of people do that, but aren't so bold as to just spell it out like that. And he does, and it, it might not be the best, but I do think it is a pretty good, well-rounded book that does take a lot of the best pieces from others. I mean, EMF has the best name, uh, Dr. Mercola's book. It's a great play on words and out of respect for him getting his Chase business account shut down. I wanted to put him on there, but I think Nick Pino's book might edge him out. It's also, I'm sure, your 10th place kind of like mine. There's an underlying assumption that I mean, do what you want with your life, people listening and watching. But like start at 10 and read to one has generally been part of the plan when it comes to the, the last few times we've done this as a book club. It certainly is for me. And the fact that it's called the non-tinfoil guide to EMFs. And Dr. McCola is Dr. McCola. So like, this one you could give to a normie and be like, oh, check it out. It even says non-tinfoil. It right. even says it. And to, to generally bring people in. That was certainly the thinking with my 10th place, which is speaking of goats, Weston A. Price himself, nutri nutrition and physical degeneration. Because this year I've been on a bit of a dental self-healing trip and I think about Weston A. Price as one of those people that the world just doesn't make anymore who was a Canadian dentist who would, in his off time, travel the world exploring the diet and health of indigenous cultures. And what a shock. They don't eat like us, and none of them are fatty, fatty bombatties, and their teeth are fine. So he's like, well, hang on a minute. What are we doing here? I go back to Canada, and I'm gluing metal to people's teeth and ripping things out. And, you know, what the hell are we doing that's different to these Trobian Islanders and what have you? And of course, if people listen to uh, THC, they'd be aware of the great Weston A. Price Foundation, which is the foundation that built on his research and delivers, I think, the best match to what a true human diet is. So when I talk about goats only, this is one of those classics where, so my little brother is a dentist, and until I introduced him to Weston A. Price, he hadn't heard of him. So they don't even hear about this guy, the greatest of the dental race <laughs> in a degree on dentistry. So you guys should know about it. I mean, this is like diet goat, right? Because what I like about the Weston A. Price diet is, and even Weston A. Price's approach, which some of the science around like naming a fat X, which is what we call Twitter now, that's not quite correct. But in New Guinea, 93% of the calories come from sweet potato and they still have no body fat and beautiful teeth. And you go to what we used to call Eskimos, same situation, except all they eat is fat. And it's like, what you get from Western A. Price, nutrition, physical gen degeneration is a via negativa. Like they're doing something that we're not rather than, oh, we should all eat 93% sweet potato. It's like, hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> they're all doing, it's all about what they're not doing. And what they're not doing is living like Westerners. So it's, a, yeah. it's a, actually very readable too. It's a, doesn't sound like it because it sounds a bit sciencey, nutrition and physical degeneration, but he's he was quite a good writer. So there's a little bit of not necessarily adventure reading in there, but you know, he did actually walk the walk around the world. So that was my number 10. What do you think? I think it's a great one to be on there. I haven't read it. It's been on the list. I've read Nourishing Traditions. I have listened to a lot of Sally Fallon Morell and the foundation's work that obviously is built on 
Weston Price himself and this book. So I, I get the residue of it, but I probably should go to the source. And I also would say, having just moved across the country to a place where I don't really know very many people, the Weston A. Price Foundation is an amazing resource, especially if you have kids, because there's chapters all over the states, at least. And you can write them, say, hey, I'm moving to the area. I need a good recommendation for a pediatrician, a midwife, a doula. I need to know where I can get the raw milk. And they will have those answers. The funny thing about Florida is you are allowed to sell raw milk, but you are not allowed to sell it for human consumption. So you have to put labels on it and say for pets only. And I'm glad I heard that because otherwise I might have avoided that particular label because it just, and it's like, don't you want to give your pets stuff that's good for them too? So in a weird way, it's like, it should be okay, but I'm also not eating canned cat food just because it's the higher brand, you know, higher quality brand. But anyone who's looking for good resources for grass fed meat in their area or raw milk, go to the Western Eight Price Foundation, find your local chapter. They'll be very willing to help. Yeah, that's awesome advice. I love it. All right. Number nine, Greg, fire away. <laughs> Quench is one of the more basic books on the list, but I really liked Dr. Dana Cohen and the book has a few things in it. You probably would be surprised by when you really start reading about the effects of chronic dehydration, at least for me, I was really surprised by how many of the boxes I check regularly. But she also includes a little bit of the Gerald Pollack stuff, the structured water stuff. So you're getting a little piece of that. And right on the slide there, the cover of the book, right across the top, it says eight ounces a day is not the way. Because one of the big things from the book is, sure, you can drink water, but that is not where you get the most absorption exactly. or the highest quality hydration for your body. You get it through fruit. The fruit holds the gel state water, the structured yeah. water. It's right there. And so it's more bioavailable. It's higher quality. And of course, in the book, she has a list of the top, you know, 20 water rich, structured water rich vegetables and fruits, mainly fruits to be eating regularly. So it's not exactly rocket science that we should all drink water, but I think that it's a little surprising when the approach is not through just water intake. And when you really read the effects of being dehydrated, I think it has a lot of value. Clearly, there, I thought there had to be one water book on the list. And Gerald Pollack's is a little sciencey, not really about health. So Quench, which incorporates a little bit of that and probably could use an addendum on hydration or on, uh, on hydrogen, then it would be a perfect book. But this is the one I got. No, I like it. And it's super funny, right? Like I got water pilled. I would have pilled myself as a kid when we learned in history that the people of Northwest Europe didn't drink much water. They would drink ale or whatever during the day because allegedly water was bad for you. And I'm like, but they drank it watered down. So it's not that like, it's not, oh yeah, there were th like bugs, fucking germ theory again, right? Right. In the water. And that began a process of me realizing, and I, I've been on dieta in the jungle with people who run water charities and are very big on, on this kind of idea. Water is a solvent. And so, I mean, I have a metal thing of structured water next to me, but there isn't a one-to-one -one between drinking water and hydration. As you say, there's a structured water component to it. One of my favorite, I'm a big fan of Tommy John the third. And at the beginning of all his videos, he's there drinking out of a mug and he's like, I'm drinking not fucking plain water. Why would I drink plain water? It doesn't taste good. It doesn't hydrate, blah, blah, blah. And that's a, bit of a bit of an overstep but it's correct if, if you're listening to this going like bullshit i am i'm literally that bitch who walks around with her big yoga water bottle what do you mean i'm not hydrated fucking look into it educate yourself it's mm -hmm. not that bad necessarily but there are optimal ways of, of being in relation to water that it's a cool it's a cool choice right and it is right on the edge of well once i get that right the total story of water is wrong and wait until you find out that it's some kind of intelligent alien being that can respond to your emotions like ectoplasm in Ghostbusters. <laughs> it's a little bit later on in your health journey, but it's nevertheless there. I think it's a great choice. Oh yeah. What do you got? So I've got 
Speaking of goats, the goat of goats when it comes to stress and trauma, Gabo Amate himself with the classic When the Body Says No. And I did some training with Dr. Amate earlier this year. It was obviously online, but when we got to the Q&A each week and people would contribute, he, it was the most amazing thing. It was almost like a stage hypnotist, but healing trauma. In about three sentences, he could just unpick what happened in someone's childhood, how that played out in their lives, and like the invitation towards release. Because if people inexplicably don't know who Gabo Mate is, he's retired and too famous to do this now, but was a Canadian psychiatrist. And he and even before that, when he was doing ward rounds of say a cancer ward, he would notice patterns. Uh, in people's history. So there was a, a certain life story that went along with breast cancer. There was a certain life story that went along with prostate cancer. And from there, he started to widen it out and realize, well, stress is causing everything, but it's actually laying down very specific patterns that we can work backwards from and, and build an idea of it. And he was, he's like a normie doctor, right? He's not, water is an alien that operates like ectoplasm. He's like, I'm a Canadian psychiatrist. And this idea of the hidden cost of stress, he was the first one to put that into Normie Land with a best-selling book. And I can translate a lot of what that is into like shaman talk, which on the training he was very open to. Like he, he would regularly make that comparison himself, which is the upset we experience psychically plays out subsequently in our body. And this is because it's low on the list, it's number nine. This is a normie book by like a king normie doctor that you can give to people to really begin to open that, to get the camel's nose under the tent there, right? Of like, oh, you just wait. <laughs> you just wait for actually how the body plays out trauma. But he, for me, had to be somewhere on this list. Yeah, this is a new one to me. So I'm psyched. I'm definitely going to check it out. Yeah, he's a, and he's just a genius. He He really is like, He's done the work himself. He's Jewish and he's done the work on how Holocaust trauma, not old enough to have participated, but his parents were like Holocaust trauma, how that's played out across generations. He's also the great Aaron Mate's dad. So uh, if people know of, you know, useful idiots and Aaron Mate being one of the few remaining actual journalists left in the world, this is his father. So there you go. Nice. All right. Moving on. Ocho eight. Lay it on us, Greg. Human Heart Cosmic Heart by Dr. Tom Cowan. They say that heart disease is the number one killer, so you got to pay attention to it. But this is the, I would say, quintessential, the heart is not a pump book. You can read Steiner, a little bit more of a difficult read, but I think through Tom Cowan, you can get kind of the best synthesis of Steiner on important medical issues. and. So that's pretty much why it's on the list. I feel like the heart, the blood, it's obviously clearly important to life and getting that right is probably going to increase your longevity. Longevity. Amazing choice. As <laughs> everyone listening knows, I think he's Paracelsus come back to earth. Tom Cowan is a healing genius. And this is his quintessential book. I mean, it, Tom Cowan, to some extent, saved my life um, with some of the material that's in this book. So I'm a fan, uh, to put it that way. But this is, if you want in to the Tom Cowan worldview, which isn't anthroposophical exactly, it's post-anthroposophical because he, there's a lot that's really good in Steiner's approach to medicine, but it doesn't work as often as, because he tried, like over the course of his career. It's like, cool, I'm just going to do the anthroposophical approach. And it didn't always work. And more specifically, it, the results were unreliable. So it certainly works better than allopathy, but it was inevitably Stein is not going to be, we know more stuff now, right? And so Tom has basically built his own theory of medicine. But with the heart, when you jailbreak the heart from allopathy, the, this is where Steiner was correct. You jailbreak everything about the human body and health from allopathy forever. Because when you understand that it's not a pump, when you understand that it is a multidimensional healing and listening organ across all of your bodies and you'll get that from this book then you're like well shit like 
everything else is wrong. <laughs> like the body is built on the idea that you have to have a healthy pump moving this weirdly viscous liquid around your and none of that's right. You do have to have a healthy heart and whatever, but it's you get everything in here. You get a bit about water, you get a bit about sunlight, you get it all from the perspective of you being the temporary custodian of this powerful multi-dimensional uh, organ. It's uh, it is a, a life-changing book. Uh, it's definitely worth it. That's yes. what I have to say about Dr. Cowan. <laughs> Blood pressure has been something that we're thinking about a lot because the reason we didn't have a great birth experience the first time was largely related to the numbers on the screen that they call blood pressure and protocols that happen when you hit certain numbers. And now again, you know, with a kid, second kid on the way in the next 30 days or so in the state of Florida, if you want to have what they call a VBAC, a vaginal birth after cesarean, it is required that you get permission from <laughs> the medical establishment as if it wouldn't Ugh. happen on its own anyway. And when we went for that meeting, blood pressure was high. And thus we started to get the conversation, hey, we need to talk to your midwife and it might be irresponsible for someone to let you have that baby in that home and yada, yada, yada. We're obviously not happy about it. And that adds stress and stress increases blood pressure. It's a vicious cycle. But lately, this past couple of weeks, I've been really like sending Teresa the Tom Cowan articles related to blood pressure and this other uh thought process regarding the heart and blood and you know we'll get it under control but it's just a thing that's happening in our lives right now so i really do appreciate tom as well oh, very cool very cool so i went with serious adverse events and uncensored history of aids by celia farber who's go in that category there's a bunch of books about the management of aids as a narrative let's say john rapaport wrote aids inc and so on but if we're going with goats in that area it's celia farber who's still doing work in the uh, shortcomings of allopathy and big pharma today uh, and it's i put it on the list because this is this is fauci's villain origin story mm. which is why if why for a lot of us what just happened was not surprising because we process this information and AIDS is the third rail. A lot of people, it's still the third rail. A lot of people will have come through the last three years with a, let's call it mostly correct understanding of what happened, but will freak out at the possibility that it, this, what we just went through is AIDS 2.0. And what does that tell you about AIDS and treatment and Fauci and business and colonialism and all the rest of it? And if you want a book that's still in normie land, which is to do with viral theory and, and whatever, Celia is it. But Celia Faber's Serious Adverse Events was the discovery of just what a scam the whole process mm -hmm. <laughs> was in the 80s. And again, people, it's a third rail. Like people were like, oh, what do you mean people didn't die of AIDS? I'm like, Jesus Christ, we have to do this again over the last three years? What do you mean people didn't ruin it? It's like, you, yes. Everyone take a deep breath. And, and read serious adverse events and then and see me in the morning. But that yeah. had to be like, we need like a, a scare story, I think, on the list. And RFK, rightly so, made it in a previous countdown. So, and Celia didn't. So, Celia belongs here because this is more a really terrifying ghost story about big pharma and politics. And mm -hmm. it's worth it. Yeah. I, it was RFK who actually informed me of this whole, you know, COVID thing being a rehash of what happened during AIDS. You know, he said, he basically said, Hey, have you ever seen that movie millionaire buyers club or Dallas buyers club? That's what it is. And I was like, yeah, he was, yeah. Fauci is the villain of that story. He's just unnamed in the movie. And I went back and watched it again. And it's like, wow. Yeah. Here's a drug that works and is being suppressed. Here's a drug that the hospitals are using that is killing people. When someone dies th after getting your treatment, you say, well, they just had too many AIDS. The AIDS got them. The threshold yeah. was just too high. And it's like, no, you slowly killed them. And so yeah. now, obviously, we know that is a thing that happens in the medical system. 
and the colonial system, because when they start talking about AIDS Africa, they have to recategorize it as a different disease and estimate the deaths from Switzerland. No one's actually there counting them. And so the people who were dying previously of poverty related illnesses were recategorized. And when they would use the tests, it made the PCR test look rational. The, the test that they actually use to confirm an HIV case in Africa is naked colonialism. And that's why, like, yeah, <laughs> a lot of what just happened wasn't, I mean, it was a shock, but it wasn't new to people like RFK. It's like, yeah, 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 this is, they're playing out another game. And in the story of true healing, you need to know that because uh, twice is not the charm. I'll probably do it again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. All righty. Moving down to number seven. Go for it, Greg. Interesting. I haven't seen that cover yet. But yes, the body electric, electromagnetism and the foundation of life by Robert Becker. This is probably the most sciencey book on my list. And it's also probably the most magic y book on my list. But it really just is a serious deep dive into the electrical layer of what a human is, which might be one of the most foundational and important layers that never really makes it onto the radar of big pharma, of course, or just Western culture in general. And there's some really interesting stuff there about, you can also say it's like the positive side of EMF, of electromagnetic frequency, because there's some wild stuff about regrowing organs and trying to capture what a salamander or I don't actually know they do use salamanders in the experiments but like what a starfish can do like regrowing limbs and that kind of thing do they regrow limbs I think salamanders yep. do right so they're trying to yep. recapture that process that seems natural and find a way through electricity to use it for people yeah Good choice. And it's like I haven't read it. All the chapters but... are wild too. They're named like the Pillars of Hercules and, you know, <laughs> Hades Goblet. And they're like, what is this chapter going to be about? Because I, it doesn't sound like it's going to be about medicine or health or anything. Yeah. I haven't it's read fun. it. I'll look into it. Yeah. Yeah. So I needed a shamanism book in here somewhere. And going by my goat rule, this is Dr. Rosita Avigo's story of her uh, apprenticeship under one of the last true Mayan shamans in Belize, Don Eligio. And the book is called Sestun. And, you know, you'll get this because you are a podcaster as well. I did an episode with Dr. Avigo in February. And it was during a cyclone. I can hear your thunder. So I'm like, it's fine. I've done them during cyclones when I was in Wellington. And she was having connection problems in Belize. So there was a lot of editing that went on with that one. But I was so proud of it, like to be able to speak to Dr. Avigo herself. And inevitably, the ones that you like the best are just not that popular. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you're all weird racist is what I'm saying, if you're listening to this. That was this book, why it's on the list out of all the shaman books, like shamanic healing style books, is when she started training with Don Eligio in the 90s, he was in his 80s. So his master who trained him grew up in the 1800s and you're basically back at particularly in belize or british honduras you're basically back at a, i don't want to say uninterrupted but pretty close cosmovision of mayan spirits and plants and philosophy of healing so it's one degree removed from that so i needed one that's in there somewhere that is the story of contact between and dr avigo was already an alternative health practitioner so-called alternative health but it's the story of like this is what a non-western tradition looked like it's in past tense now she still teaches it but she got to train under someone whose master was like 1800s right so proper pre-allopathy pre-everything and it's, it's a really powerful story of how everyone else understood plants and healing and so on so it's goat it's a healing journey there are actual recipes in it like actionable recipes but dr avigo has plenty more in that area like rainforest medicine and so on i just needed a story of contact with a healing modality that isn't western and in a list of 10 
this is the one that made the list. Nice. I like it. That's a great pitch. I'll have to check that one out too. Yeah, it's powerful stuff. It really God's is. Really want me to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, she's probably like Dr. Avigo specializes in women's health and women's reproductive health. So hmm. the gods probably do want you guys to make contact. So yeah. Anyway. Awesome. Number six, Greg, what do we got? Yeah, Becoming Supernatural, How Common People Are Doing the Uncommon by Dr. Joe Dispenza. I think this one's pretty well known out there. When I was making my list, I thought about a stress book, and I didn't really have one. And I don't really read stress books. I know it's important, but I think I'm naturally low stress. And this is kind of that because it's really a meditation book. It's like, here's the science of meditation. And in the middle of the book, there are charts and, and graphs and all the measurable data that you would want to look at if you don't really think that meditation is very consequential. There's some wild stories in there that are almost Charles Fort-like, but it's just really the depth of what meditation and mindset, like we, we could just say mindset somewhat manifestation adjacent, but the effects of the right mindset and meditation and stress reduction on health. And it's just, it's a wild ride. Dr. Joey D, you've got another goat on your list as well. That's yeah. I, it, he's the goat of that kind of stuff. That's for sure. So yes, yes. excellent choice. Excellent choice. I went with a book that has to stand in for a whole category of books. I wanted a plant medicine herbalism book of some description in there. The trouble is best practice herbalism is bioregion specific. So I've got some Australian ones, which aren't as relevant. I could have gone and I thought about going classics. I thought about going Culpeper or the Kiranides or Kiranides. So ancient Greek, well, early Greek. And that also wasn't quite right. So what I needed was a herbalism book that tells the story of herbalism in such a way that you can go, okay, I get it now. So as I begin or continue my plant medicine journey, it is essential that it's situated, right? That's basically how most of it works. And in fact, you'd get that from Sastun. So I went with Dr. Wolf Dieter Stahl's The Untold History of Healing. And he's, he's actually kind of on the edges of the psychedelic re renaissance of the 60s and 70s. And is a very elderly now, still alive. Uh, he's been on the show a few years ago, and he's an anthropologist or was an anthropologist. He studied with Turtle Island medicine men and studied European healing. And this book's really cool because he, he looks at some of the plants that humans have plainly been in relationship with for tens of millennia, like juniper and so on. And that's why it's in this list. It's like, oh, wow, we've actually been on this like plant journey or plant companion journey for tens of millennia. And the that bit is the same. And the bit that is different is wherever we happen to be, the plants are different. So it's not that, oh, you need to have juniper as a plant ally. It's, oh, I, oh okay, I get it. And there are lessons from First Nations people as to how to understand new plants. So rather than bringing just European plants into your herbalism in somewhere in the new world. So I had to, I needed like a herbalism book. And this one is a history book that sets you up to be in a better place for going on that plant healing journey. Yeah, I love it. I'm learning more on this list than in previous lists because conspiracy, paranormal, yeah, I've been through that. But there's a lot of different ways to approach health and healing. And these kind of books are great. They help to break the programming that you need big pharma, that healing doesn't go back forever. And I thought about herbalism as well. And that's a hole in my list because I just, you know, I don't know quite enough about it. I'm actually talking to a guy who's a forager right now about like, can we get hours out of this? Is this an episode I should do? But it's an interest of mine, even outside of what I think makes for good on-air content, but that's cool. It's a good one. Yeah. yeah. I think people would expect that one more from me than you. So it had to be somewhere in there. Anyway, number four. Five. Go for yeah, it. Enlightening. Mind over medicine, Dr. Lisa Rankin. This is kind of adjacent to Magic is Real by Dr. Dean Radin, or you could even say the biology of belief, which was like another contender for 
this space, but I just went with a, a lesser known, perhaps. I mean, I think it's pretty well known. It is a New York Times bestseller, but I think our people really know, you know, the other books on this kind of thing, but it's just a great book about mindset and the power to heal oneself in that Bruce Lipton-y kind of way, or like Dean Radin's book, Magic is Real, is a lot about like positive intention. It's really more about like Lynn McTaggart stuff than it is about pentagrams and robes. So it's just the basically the power of the mind. And it's just, it's good armor for when you feel like you don't, you might need to go and retreat and, and find some external source of healing. It's like, no, you got most of the components internally and you just need to reconvince yourself, pull this book off the shelf and reconvince yourself that uh, you can do it. Okay. So I'm not sure if I'm in alignment with this choice for personal reasons. Have you read Sacred Medicine by Lisa Rankin? No. All right. So I was listening to that as an audio book. Well, speaking of Tom Cowan last year, beginning that month of ECP therapy in New Zealand, where they, you basically lie on a bed and they, that you get these weird Velcro, almost like big blood pressure cuffs, but for your legs. And you're stuck on this bed for an hour as it counter pulses blood at double the volume back into your heart, like a chung, a chung, a chung. So it's kind of boring. And so I listen to audio books. The trouble is if they're not good, you can't change them because you're strapped to a bed having like blood forced into your heart by this big machine. And I thought, oh, I'm going to listen to healing books. And so I listened to Sacred Medicine, which was the most painfully woke hair shirt, hair pulling white people, Black Lives <laughs> Matter woke. Like that level of like, oh, we're all so bad for page after page after page after page. And I'm like, sorry, Lisa, <clears throat> your, your reputation did precede you. But I, so, when this one came up, which I haven't read because I got trapped on a machine whilst I had to listen to her <laughs> gnash and wail about being white for too long. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, and you know, that's a, that virus gets a lot of people. I yeah. think another reason I like it is that she's got a big chapter about like working yourself to death and that, you know, it's just kind of counterculture in that sense of like, give up your job. It's killing you. You know, I kind of like that attitude. Uh, okay. I'm like, I'll read that. That sounds good. It actually sounds like something it's I'd gonna be. But it's probably, you're past it. You're past this book. This is uh Well, you say that. I like, definitely work too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. But, oh my goodness. Sacred medicine. The, at least the audiobook version, which would have been released uh, still Trump era. So I don't need to tell listeners to this show the tone that it was at, but it just went forever. And it went forever in a way that I was trapped listening to, <laughs> trapped listening and listening, going, ah, oh, because I thought it's fine. You know what it's like. You have guests who will make a throwaway comment where it's like, mm, I'm just going to let that slide because I have other stuff to talk about with them. all and the I time. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought that was going to be the case with this book. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, it's coming out at that time. I'll just let her sit through the details of her Maoist style struggle sessions about being white that she considers essential. And I'm like, eh, you know, next paragraph, we'll get back to the actual science of healing. Nope. 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 Anyway, that's a different book. I have not read Mind Over Medicine. <laughs> I'm like, I'll actually have, I'll give it a look for the no working stuff. But I went with, my so-called EMF book, I guess, number five for me, is another goat, of course, Clint Ober's Earthing, the most important health discovery ever, which is potentially overselling it. But I won't pretend that having the earthing mats on my bed for the last year haven't been a powerful part of my own healing journey. And in the funny and exciting coincidence way, Dr. Sam Bailey just did an interview with him that came out a few days prior to recording this, which is excellent. And what I like about Clinton or Clint Ober's approach to let's call it EMF moderation, I suppose, is he's quite, listen, it's fine. And I would beg to differ on some of the points. Like there's no evidence that cell phone technology is bad for you. Not that he's pro cell phone technology, but he's like, there's actually no evidence that it does all the things that a lot of these scare claims say, like that's not necessarily quite right. But what he is saying is that earthing or grounding yourself generates that protective field mm. and so 30 to 45 minutes a day of just feet on the earth is sufficient we can't do that for half the year down here because it's cold so we have the mats which is better because we're doing it for longer these grounding mats that plug into your 
PowerPoint next to the bed. But he gives this away for free. The movie, if you buy stuff from him, the movie uh, is full length, the documentary, and free, no ads on YouTube. So if you haven't heard about this, this is an intervention in your healing that everyone will benefit from because earthing or grounding is that broad spectrum inflammation reduction. It is a powerful contributor to all forms of healing wherever you sit on the rest of the cosmology we're looking at here, terrain versus viral, whatever you want, this will help. And the science behind it is there. And his products are not just good. We had some issues because I was buying it from Mexico to deliver to Tasmania last year. And there was some confusion there and some bits were sold wrong. And you know, because it's so rare these days, when you actually get really good and helpful, friendly customer service, particularly online, you not just remember it, but share it. And I would just like to say that the people at, I believe it's earthing.net are excellent <laughs> and friendly and helpful. So that is like a, a, a positive review of everything to do with Clint Oprah's work, including his subsequent products, if you vibe with them. Interesting. Good to know. I saw a podcast where he was promoting the documentary and I put him on my very long list of people to dig deeper into and might make a good guest. And I just thought, are we going to get two hours out of putting your feet on the earth? And I've always been skeptical of earthing mats. It's interesting to hear from you that no, they work, I but I just, I've always been like, is this just some hippy dippy new age way to like a supplement to say, oh no, you did it. You did the thing. And it's like, no, you got to put your feet on the fucking earth. You can't just have this mat under your computer, but Hey, if it works, it works. I would, for me, sleeping on it is better. Right. And it's been part of the overall sleep hygiene. We have only red light in the room, you know, blackout uh, curtains. I sleep with earplugs. I take it very seriously as everyone should. But the first night I came back, cause they were delivered while I was still on my Latin odyssey last year. The first night I came back, and yeah, I guess I was a bit tired, but the the first few nights I just went, I, I fell asleep like a lead balloon, like boom. And that's typically the first thing people realize when they put the earthing mat on. They wake, they'll go to sleep and wake up like they've been abducted by aliens. Like, what the what, what happened? I, I went to sleep. I woke up like a normal person and refreshed. I don't know about other earthing mats. I can just say that Clint stuff works really well. But you don't, as he says, you don't need it. Like if you can get feet on the earth for 30 to 45 minutes a day and you live somewhere sunny enough, I mean, it's a little bit, a little bit hectic weather-wise outside at the moment, but you live somewhere where you don't necessarily need them, but it's, they were, they were a, a part of my healing journey that I'm very grateful for. I'd put it that way. Nice. nice one. I like it. It's, it's something I've been meaning to check out. I'm glad it popped up here. Awesome. And popped up halfway through, right? Because as I not only is Clint Ober a goat, but by the time you're here in my list, you're ready to, you're very open to the idea that, wait, seriously, just feet on the ground provides powerful anti-inflammatory effects. And it's like, well, yeah, when was the last time you did it? And I say, oh, shit. It's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> it uh, is a good question. Sometimes yeah. it's, if you really think about it, it's been months or years that you went yeah. outside without shoes and walked yep. on the ground with sufficient time right and i can tell you the ayahuasca helped but like i'd, I'd read this and i knew my stuff was home when i was in peru on dieta and i was a bit it's funny like mm, i'm in the middle of the amazon should i go barefoot i did but only for 45 minutes a day because i'm like i will 100 percent step on a snake <laughs> if i keep doing this right but it was maybe it was partly the amazon maybe it was something else but those for uh, the ayahuasca but I began to realize the power of like, I haven't done this for a long time. And even it's not just like put your feet in dirt, right? It will work walking along the beach. So just for people who are like, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the science behind it and give it a crack. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on to number four. And you've picked one that I definitely haven't read that appears to have been written by Larry David. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, this is just, this has been a, a helpful book to me. I like that it's a pre-internet 90s looking oh, yeah. book. It's just got an interesting look to it. And I think he wrote it at a time when it wasn't so taboo to write, oddly, because even on the top of it, it's one of America's leading pediatricians puts parents back in control of their children's health. Like, 
the and system people kind of it's called like how to raise a healthy child in spite of your doctor and yes. i'm glad we're talking about the title carry on robert s mendelson and it's just, you know, it's been helpful to me in particular with a child because you want to avoid big pharma, but your kid can't tell you what's wrong. And when your kid <laughs> runs a fever for the first time, it's really scary to just do nothing. But the whole premise of this book, pretty much chapter after chapter, is just don't do anything. Most problems solve themselves with kids. Obviously, there are extremes, but he's just saying, don't rush to the doctor for every little thing, every tummy ache, every 101 fever, because what the doctors will do will make your kids sicker than if you yeah. do nothing. And they might alleviate symptoms, but the real goal is to do nothing. And it's, it's pretty high on my list because we had a particular night where Theory had a fever that was getting to be like 104. And it's one in the morning and I'm like, damn it, this is a scary number. Should I have like, it's already in the middle of the night. I should have probably done something about this four hours ago if I was going to do something about it. And we let her ride it out and she was fine. And in this book, he says 106. He says, if your temperature okay. is under 106, don't do anything. It's going to be fine. But he, he goes over the whole claims about brain damage and he's like, you know, a lot of the intense things they do are pumping you with Advil when you have the, the your body is in this Excellent. vulnerable condition yeah. has more to do with that than the fever itself. And it's just, it was helpful for me in really stressful moments overnight when you really feel alone with a situation that feels scary with a one-year-old. And she's really only had two fevers and is almost two years old. And based on the other parents, I know that's impressive because their right. kids are sick like every other week. They're constantly giving them fever reducing pills and the fevers come back 10 days later because the body didn't do what it needed to do. So this is kind of my fever book, which is a, a thing I learned about kind of from Tom Cowan, but it is in the alternative health world. But I mean, the true healing world, let's say that fever is a function of the body it's a feature not a bug and don't rush to remove fever and i'm really reducing the whole book to just that point but i think it's the most important point when it comes to health and young kids it's a really powerful point right because even people listening to this nodding along it's almost like that germ theory terrain theory moment where oh yeah but if i get a fever i'm going to take some drugs it's like well do you believe that the body knows better than you and certainly your doctor what it needs to do from a healing perspective particularly if the inputs are good so theory at this age is basically nothing but mitochondria and she has like a best practice diet so i'm sure it's fucking scary when it gets up to those red line numbers but it's like she knows what she's doing it just <laughs> it's just going to be a little bit unpleasant for a while and it's intense i know what you mean about Doctors don't write books like this anymore, right? So because it's a series of magazines rather than a book, Lynn McTaggart, who I have a tremendous respect for, for all her research in the field and frontier science, for actually most of her last 30 years has been running a periodical called What Doctors Don't Tell You. So most of her research is in what this is, you know? <clears throat> mm -hmm. And it used to be, this is what was so funny about the last three years, you used to be able to say, no, I'm more of a terrain theorist. And people would be like, cool, cool, cool. As opposed to now where they're like, well, you're Australian, so you're going to be moved into that camp we just built for you. That escalated quickly, right? right. And people like Lynn, who has, has this enormous audience that has a high degree of overlap with the Lisa Rankins of this world. Mm. I was very interested to see how she navigated the last three years, and she did a pretty good job of it because her whole, it's weird that... Mm here we are in 2023 and the research that she has that's the most dangerous isn't the field stuff isn't the fucking miracles anymore it's oh wait do you think no allopathic medicine except antibiotics has had any positive effect at all over the last hundred years and she's like literally i've been studying this for 30 years that is correct <laughs> the only like the only chemical based drug that has actually improved over 
the alternatives or like didn't generate more side effects than what it did in the last hundred years, it's been antibiotics. And even that one, you can make some uh, claims about. And that now, like she's got the evidence for that, but that now is like, okay, off to the camp with you as well, Lynn. Mm -hmm. And it's funny. In the 90s, you could write a book or a magazine called What Doctors Don't Tell You or How to Raise a Healthy Child in Spite of Your Doctor. Now, if you say that and you're Australian, you might get sent to a camp. It's uh, This is why this is such a big fucking deal these days. Yeah, you'll get your license pulled if you're this guy yeah. trying to put this book out today. But it has a weird Reader's Digest vibe to it. I really should look at who published it, but it it has this like endorsed from the system vibe. Like this guy was probably on Oprah back in the day, something like that, you know? Well, mine was. I think Gary Schwartz has been on Oprah. So my <laughs> number four is The Energy Healing Experiments by Dr. Gary Schwartz. And obviously I need, speaking of Lynn McTaggart, some kind of like, turns out energy healing works book in here. And the reality is this is the best current overview of the even just like materialist science experiments that demonstrate the efficacy of energy healing along different modalities. And kind of like, because we've had Real Magic by Dr. Raiden, which has some real cool stuff in it on previous lists, I could put that there for the same reason, because he's got research on what energy healing and intention does for foods and water and so on. And there's kind of that stuff in here. There's biophotons. There's all the rest of it. But this is one of those cornerstones of energy healing research. And that's why it's up high in the list, because obviously it needs to, like Dr. Dieter Stoll's book, stand in for a huge category, which is like energy healing, <laughs> right? And and if you haven't read it, that's a good one to give to normies as well. Yeah, this is another one that's new to me, but it looks like that kind of skull experiments, full encapsulation of a whole area of science. So yeah, it probably belongs on the shelf. Yeah. If anything, it undersells it. And I think that's why, I'm, why I put it in. So some of Lynn's subsequent research with people like Dr. Schwartz is a bit more electrifying literally, but this is, you won't finish this book without going like, huh, well, this changes a lot. And that's why it's quite high up on my list. That's why it's number four. But now we make it to the podium. Number three, Greg, what do you got? I got, I got James. Under lightning. <laughs> yeah, I got James Nestor's Breath, the New Science of a Lost Art. It's a fairly recent book. It was fairly popular with the bro science guys. He did all the podcast rounds. I almost asked him myself, but again, I was like two hours on just breath. I don't know. <laughs> uh, every other podcast is an hour, so I get it. But man, it well, is just he was, a, on, no, he was on Joe Rogan. I did not listen because I'm like, I can't do three hours of just breath. Oh, really? Well, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Well, no, either that or Joe's just spoken about it. But anyway, carry on. Sorry. Yeah. Well, it's just crazy that the breath and the way we breathe is such a huge factor. I mean, he goes over mouth taping like at night, which some people think is very dangerous, but I, you know, I've always had sinus issues. Like I call it allergies, but it's really just like nasal issues. And he makes the claim in this book that you can solve that just by using the muscle of the nasal passages and forcing yourself to take the right breath, which is basically seven seconds out, seven seconds in, and just force yourself to do that. And it's been helpful to me because you you do it so unconsciously that when you remind yourself of the breath, you're also kind of doing like a, a mindfulness in the moment meditation type thing. And he also goes deep into just how powerful the nasal passages are as a filter that if you mouth breathe, you will get sick more often because your mouth does not have the same filter that your nose does. Just all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, also, I didn't know that most of the weight we lose, we think of it as something that comes out during sweat, like burning fat. You get in the gym and you burn fat and you sweat it out. The science says that most of our weight loss actually comes out of our breath. And so there's just a lot of really weird facts like that in the book. And it's the book that I think about most often when it's like, no, do the seven second breathing. You're just driving. You're just watching this movie. And anytime I can't breathe that well, I think about 
trying to work it out like a muscle. And it's a lot of actionable intelligence and none of it costs anything. It's just your attention and maybe some mouth tape. Yeah. James does the mouth tape thing, mouth tape. And he also combines it with like the Alex Hormozzi nose tape, at least to start with. Because if you're worried about like, am I going to be able to, you can double tape to start. But yeah, I'm a big fan of breath. Wim Hof's stuff is better done in video. So it's one of the categories that doesn't quite make it to my list, but I'm glad it made it to yours because that counts. And my third, Dr. Joey D, Joe Dispenza, making it back to the list just a little bit higher and with a different book. Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself is my probably most actionable one on this list. And again, thinking through my logic of putting the whole top 10 together, by the time you've made it to three, you're ready for some of the transformations that he talks about uh, in this book. And this was the one that during my healing journey that I had my German new medicine consultant recommend as the baseline collection of practices to adjust my thinking. And so I did, and it was certainly part of it. And so I, this one's more like, if you know, if there's some deep trauma patterns or something like that, that you know is at the root of a particular condition, this book, there's more to it than becoming supernatural. Like you have to do more, <laughs> but yeah, that's why he's on this list. And I don't think there's any, yeah, I'm happy that Dr. Dispenza made it to the list twice because if he's like the king of that mind frame adjustment in this kind of world yeah i that's one of his i haven't read but knowing him i'm sure it's great yeah it, well, it, this is more actionable like if you need more convincing like becoming supernaturals in there this one's like start with this <laughs> and end with these exercises and they're quite they're quite extreme so anyway that's my number three here comes Two. Go for it, Greg. <laughs> well, I have the primal fat burner, live longer, slow aging, superpower your brain and save your life with a high fat, low carb paleo diet by Nora Gedgaudis. It is my diet book and I don't really do keto. I don't really practice it. I think it's probably the most accurate science in terms of the best diet for you. But this made it on my list because it is so thorough. It's very robust. It's close to 300 pages. She actually does have not only recipes in there, but she goes through a lot of major health conditions one by one. She goes through the vitamins one by one that you would you know, have a higher concentration of by following this diet. And when I was cutting books, there were a couple that are really good, like Sugar Crush, which is Dr. Richard Jacoby's book about how bad sugar is for your body. And then there's Wheat Belly, which is the classic book uh, about how bad modern wheat is for you. And then there's uh, Grain Brain, I believe is what it's called, which is another one of those books. So I thought I could kind of cover the spread of at least, also Fat for Fuel is a, a Mercola book, but I took four of my runners up and their content is all in this book. And that's really the reason it made it on the list. Uh, there's a lot of components to health. What you eat is one of them. And if I could take my own advice, uh, this is the way I would eat all the time. And it, cover, it covers the negative effects of those other things like the sugars and the modern grains. So it's even though it's trendy with the paleo keto thing, it also throws the right shade at the things you shouldn't be eating. And that's why it's here. No, good choice. Really good choice. And there's a diet book as in a, and not like a, put the fork down fatty way, but like there's a, here's how you should be eating book uh, on the list, which I think is really important. And it is like, at least at the level of physical health, like if you haven't got that right, mm -hmm. things like energy healing and earthing are only going to do so much. They will help. But a friend of mine, who's a, a Reiki healer, Lance. So he, like, he'll have clients who keep coming back to him. And he's like, well, I'll fix you up. But if you go back to do, <laughs> doing the same thing, next week when you show up, I'll fix you again. And we'll just carry on with this pattern. So he's got some clients that treat Reiki like allopathy, like fix me back up, Doc. It's like, we can. Or... <laughs> in the intervening few days, you can make some changes so that you don't need to come back and see me. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. a powerful one there, of course, is is how one manages the diet. And it's an excellent choice. It really is. Obviously, that's how I think people should be eating as well. Although I will say, because we both have a sizable vegan audience, I am of the low carb, high fat, even keto for world that isn't anti-vegan. Like <laughs> I don't care. And I mean, there's ways you can do that. I, I think animal fat is essential, but the vegans I know who stick with it and live reasonably good lives are aware of that. And they're like, yeah, this is like a philosophical choice. It's, mm-hmm. They're not arguing an irrational science. And that is fi- like, particularly if people go off a, a, a sad, a standard American, it works for Australia as well, diet and moved into anything better and in fact if you do veganism right to start with you are cutting a bunch of carbs you're cutting seed oils you're doing all those really good things so it's like live go for it and there's a peruvian medicine man and and philosopher akan lushwala that i really like and one of the things he was taught growing up in peru and training in peru was that one of the other reasons that you should eat local plant life in particular like things that are grown in your area is inti so the sun provides updates for the animals in an area through like solar codes into plants that you then eat so there's like a there's an energetic component to uh, eating local plant matter which i think is very interesting uh, and obviously animals upregulate plant matter but they said that's what the, the tradition is the tradition and the tradition is the sun itself will provide local updates for you from not just the healing, but life practice through sunlight on plants that you then eat. So for whatever that's worth, I mean, it didn't make it onto the list, but I think about that when I think about the arguably unnecessary flashpoint between ketovore and vegans. Sure, sure. Yeah, I like that sun code kind of thing, that update perspective i mean just to tack on something dr zach bush says that i repeat too often is he makes a a argument that the life force energy in fruit and vegetables it starts to wane as soon as it's plucked from the plant and out of the living ground and it's just an interesting thing to think about because if that's true when was the last time you ate something kind of like the earthing question that is right off the vine. When was the last time? Because if it sat at the grocery store, you know it came on a truck, you know it sat in a warehouse, you know it probably is coated in several things to keep it looking nice and bright on the shelf. But you know, if there is some kind of unknown quality, un, unregisterable quality, unmeasurable quality in that life energy that you have to eat right off the vine, I think that's kind of worth thinking about. And we probably should eat. That gets back to eating seasonally eating things that are getting direct sunlight, you know, all that. It was Dr. Bush who said, if you can, and I did this because we had tomatoes at the time. And uh, he said, you, if you can bite the tomato off the vine, because even just this, you lose energetic loss from the act of plucking it and putting it in your mouth. And we had a bunch of them in the greenhouse when I saw that video in April, 2020, I know exactly when and what the video was. I'm like, all right, I'll try it. And you know, there's something to it, but we have carrots and whatever through the winter. And it's funny, as far as I can tell, 80% of the energetic value comes from actually a small amount. So it's almost like any of these health interventions, like 80% of the improvement in your fitness is going to come in the first few months of embarking on a fitness journey. Same thing with a nutritional journey. Here we are in the dead of winter. We still have carrots going and, and some green stuff. And that's not a one because it's high in carbs, but it's not something that I eat that often. But I noticed the difference in the energetics because I actually got supermarket carrots versus ours and did it like an energy taste test the other day. And I think if people are like, yeah, that's all well and good. We live in the year 2023. I can't just, and I don't live in the middle of some very middle class market garden. That's all true. But I actually think, Put in a little bit of effort, even just having a small amount of that local energetics seems to have an outsized impact, which would books that haven't made it onto our list, homeopathy and whatever there's when you're operating at the level of the field, mass and scale is less significant. So if you're overwhelmed by the idea of like, yeah, but I can't eat locally because of blah, blah, blah. And all of those reasons are very valid. Just give it a shot. Just be like, you know what? I am actually going to commit 
to the idea that there is something energetic about this. And you'd be surprised how much just like a few local carrots will move the needle, as long as they're not just a few local carrots you eat before two Domino's pizzas, right? Like <laughs> it's not going to perform miracles. But that's been my experience growing my own food. And my experience with energetics is that there's, you get more value than you think because everyone has that cynical moment when they come back from the supermarket and they're like, well, I swung by the farmer's market and I got a couple of leeks, which I'm going to include in this meal of otherwise supermarket ingredients. Don't diminish that. Like big that up. Right. And, and that's why Akan Lushwala's words stay with me. It's like, well, you, you're still getting the update from the sun God by doing that. And it does seem to move those energetics more than you would think. So that's my final bit of my only bit of diet advice actually on the countdown is don't just dismiss the whole idea because it is correctly impractical in 2023 to live like that 100% of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's well said. It is a motivator, like whether there's something to it or not, if you kind of lean into it, it's like, well, then you have to start growing something or you have to go to the farmer's market a little bit more. And it's just fun. It's fun to it support your local economy and engage in life that way. Nice one. And you're Speaking number two. I think I've heard of this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, his name rings a bell, but it's Human Heart, Cosmic Heart by Paracelsus <laughs> Reborn, Dr. Thomas Cowan. And for reasons that I mentioned before, this book is may well, if any book can lay claim to having saved my life, <laughs> this is one of them. Uh, this is it. This is that book. And it's for all the reasons we said before. And for me, all of those reasons and the fact that I think Thomas Cowan is a fucking actual once in a century genius. He's at number two. Uh, he's at number two on my list, which begs the question of what's number one. So on to the final slide, Greg, tell us about your number one. Well, my number one is what really makes you ill. Why everything you thought you knew about disease is wrong. For people who can see the video, look at the size of this phone book, sized book. The reason this is on here is because of just how damn thorough it is at almost 800 pages. If you start to tiptoe into the terrain theory waters, you start asking yourself, well, what about the Black Plague? Or what about polio? Or what about this other thing? And this book is going to cover all of it. It come, it shows you the alternative perspective on how a bunch of people in a certain area or time could have died or could have had similar symptoms without it being some rogue virus that required vaccination. So that's why I think it's on here is it, it covers the spread of a lot of other interesting things. I had some books in the runners up list that were more focused on like one specific case, like New Light on the Black Death is a cool, interesting book, but that's gonna be in here. You know, it's condensed to yeah. 10 pages or five pages, but I think it's probably the best book I could say, like if you aren't sure, think of any disease from the past and go to the index in the back and look up the page that they talk about it and then consider it as possible. And then the more you do that, I think it just, it sends you down that path. And it's like, wow, I didn't really realize there was a different way to think about all these instances of mass disease or illness at one time that were told from Western medicine was disease X, Y, or Z. What people, like, I would say 55% of people listening to this still consider themselves germ theorists. And I would actually say that 5% of them really are because people seem to think germ theory is, no, people seem to think that terrain theory is there's no such thing as pathogens. That's not correct. Germ theory is the idea that there is a literal physical particle that is the cause of one particular disease and a different shaped particle is a cause of a different disease and so on down the list of every disease. Right. This is wrong. <laughs> this is actually not correct. And up until March 2020, I actually thought even allopathy had moved past it because there's functional medicine, there's preventative medicine. There was this idea that like kids need 30 minutes minimum of exercise a day. Sunlight was coming back. All this kind of terrain best practice was coming back. And then we hit, well, 
we hit Fauci 2.0. And it's like, no, no, no. Because literally behind the demonic worldview of that actual murderous demon is there is a particle that is this shape and it causes these disease, these symptoms. And just next to it is a particle of a different shape that causes either different things or the same, like cold and flu and the rest of it. That's germ theory and it's wrong. That's just simply incorrect. Now, can then people are like, oh, yeah, but what about if you get poisoned? But like, that's not a germ. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's a toxin. People think that there aren't toxins in terrain theory. Exactly. And that's why 55% of people listening to this think they're germ theorists because of whataboutism. What really makes you realize a book will cure your whataboutism, right? And open up the possibility of it. And that was the bit. It was actually last time I was on Alpha Vedic. Bear said at the beginning when the whole pandemic narrative started he's like i had to do because it was the same for me it's like i had to do two things which was to explain the difference between viral and terrain theory but also explain that terrain theory itself isn't quite right which is true like once with his stuff it's all bioenergetics and so on but a better way of saying that is that your physical health is conditional on some non-physical things like the energetics which is not always there in terrain theory official terrain theory is all good stuff, eat right, sunlight, exercise, sleep, blah, blah, blah. There are spirits and there are, you know, other things that are going on. And that was a really, I'm glad he said that because I've thought about that ever since. And what I say now is I'm not really a, I'm not a germ theorist. And I'll say, you know, I'm a bit of a terrain theorist because that is correct because I am. <laughs> but there are other things outside of terrain theory. And it was, I was so glad that I heard Bear say that, like, I had to explain <laughs> the difference between the two, but then also say, because the energy of the last three years has been a pushing away, rightly so, from germ theory into terrain theory and not, I would say, enough yet anyway, understanding that terrain theory itself is from the same era. It's also a 19th century philosophy, really. Mm -hmm. And so consequently, it, it has some areas where we can update it, but this is like a really good example of curing what aboutism. Like, what about this? What yeah. about when the Spaniards got to South America? Like, you know, are you saying nobody died? It's like, can you? This is the bit. That's where I find the trauma when people hit. Oh, you mean no one died when the Spanish showed up in South America? It's like, no. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> right. But people are so, they've built a trauma around the idea of a germ, around the idea of an icky particle that as a baby will cause their death by ostracism from the tribe that you can't like, oh, what, so, what, so what about hookers? It's like, well, they're <laughs> awesome. But what was your exact question? Right. <laughs> so I'm glad this is number one for you because I wasn't sure. I actually haven't got to mine yet. There is no explicit germ versus terrain theory on my list because actually this is the other point Bear was making and I think we can make as well. It's not you either can, or. Yeah, but also like you can have whatever take you want about German terrain theory. You still have the opportunity of approaching like a powerful health transformation regardless like if you do the stuff that is in these books if you do the things that are best practice even if you think that whatever you think about lab leak theory and the rest of it is to some extent immaterial to grounding diet sleep meditation and so on uh, right and that's why i'm like okay cool is it even in my top 10 i love the metaphysics and philosophy of it i love so much empowerment can come out of stepping more into terrain, right? Because you're no longer operating in fear and you're no longer operating at the inside the demonic reality of allopathic medicine. So much empowerment can come from it. But ultimately, I don't care. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, as long yeah. as you're doing health best, health best practice with the exception of injections and chemicals and so on, health best practice looks the same in germ or terrain. And it's all the things that are on our lists as far as I can tell. Yeah. Yeah. That's why this book is really there is just to get people out of the mindset of, well, no matter what I do, no matter how good am I, yeah. I take care of myself. There's these little squiggles out there. There's these invisible things and they'll just wreck me and kill me. And this book kind of shows you that that's not the case. And even in examples that you would go to thinking that it is, there's another way to look at it.
But mm-hmm. yours, Excellent. your number one is one I haven't heard of. I thought I'd at least know your number one author. I don't even know this guy. That's amazing. All right. So Ivan Illich, I've spoken about him a couple of times in my AI solo show series. So he is dead now, but he was a Roman Catholic priest who grew up sort of in Croatia, but uh, then moved at a young age to New York, the 20th century, and uh, transformed the Puerto Rican community uh, from a almost like a health and empowerment level in Harlem and, and whatever. And as a result of that, he ended up at a young age becoming the head of education for all of Puerto Rico. And he's one of those people that the church births every couple of centuries. Like he's somewhere in between a saint and a church father because he, and he ran afoul inevitably as all the good ones do of the church for realizing a whole bunch of stuff. One of them is aid is wrong. Like this is actually causing more damage than not. And he, and so in the area of aid and development and medicine and education and all of these things, he realized that this Western approach is wrong. And it's a a specific kind of predictable wrong, which is there in the limits to medicine. And it's a theory of technology. So a technology in the first half of its life provides some kind of benefit that in the second half of the life, it removes and makes worse. And an example of that is the automobile, which in the first half of its existence enabled people to get somewhere faster until there were too many of them. And it made people get places slower and made them healthy, unhealthier or killed them. So the same intervention does at a different point in its life cycle, two different things. And he wrote this in the seventies about medicine. And we've just gone through the 40 years, the second half of allopathic medicine, where it inarguably is doing more damage than it initially, when people are like, oh, what about when we cured this? It's like, do you mean when we started washing our hands or whatever? Like, or do you mean when we improved our diet? But in that second half of a technology's life, or the, even if it's not a split into half, it comes a point where it not only stops working, but it actively undoes the thing <laughs> that it was supposed to do. And that's the limits to medicine. And it's this really powerful transformative philosopher who ran like an anti-aid aid agency in Mexico for like 25 years, just the most incredible person, obviously dead now, but most incredible person. Never, the church kicked him out. He refused to offer mass when he was arguing with the church and so on, but he never left the church. He, everything that he did, and this is what I mean by the church does this every couple of centuries, will have this guy that Everyone else is like, fuck you and your kitty fucking and your thieving of all the money and all the blatant venal corruption of the church. And then every once in a while, someone comes along who sees all that and is like, we can be better. Do you know what I mean? We can actually transform this just by existing. And he was an agitator to the church, which it didn't really do, doing better. But so limits to medicine is, again, it's goats only. And this is the goat of goats when it comes to, I would say, a modern critique on medicine. And once you come to the end of this book, many, even the authors that are on our list will look intellectually puny next year. It's really powerful stuff. So that's where he's at the, the top of the list. There's, you will be changed after you read Illich, after you read his books on, or his work, because a lot of it's just essays, but his work, this is a small book on education or technology or so on. And a couple of the early AI solo shows go into that from a theory of technology perspective, but this is how that same idea, which is a medieval theory of technology, actually, long story, applies to medicine. So that's my number one. I like it. That's a hell of a pitch. I will check it out. No, very good. Very good. All right. So in many respects, the fun part of these countdowns is where we can oh, relax and give some love to the books that we really, really like <laughs> that didn't make it to the list. So I, I'm going to start with categories that I am disappointed can't make it into a top 10, but I understand why they can't, right? So the germ versus terrain theory, I think I just covered as to why, which is it's 
in many respects, although not all, immaterial to improvements in your health, whether you think physical different particles of different shapes cause the difference between a cold and a flu or a viral and bacterial pneumonia or whatever you like. Do you know what I mean? Like that's up to you. Doesn't move the needle as much as you'd want. Mm -hmm. Helps you avoid the needle, but doesn't move it very much. Energy healing explicitly. So there's no books on Reiki. If I was to use one of Alberto Violdo's books, it would be Shaman Healer Sage. German New Medicine doesn't actually have any good books, which is a pity because I would have liked to have put something in there. It's an over-described true thing. So German New Medicine, the closest I got is The Psychic Roots of Disease by um, Bjorn Ebel, who has actually disavowed since then most of the stuff in the book, not GNM, but like I was too overly prescriptive and overly confident in that book, which is actually GNM's problem, right? That it will work backwards. It's like 80% correct. But if you try to get super precise, like, oh, this is an epileptoid crisis in the left half of your brain that happened because of this. It's too detailed. It's too German, frankly. Mm. Uh, <laughs> RFK, who we mentioned. Yeah. Health crimes in general, other than Celia Farber's book. And I didn't get EMF. So Invisible Rainbow would have been good on this list. Yeah. Um, fourth phase of water. Nothing on entheogens or body movement. And I didn't have any forest bathing. Like, but what I would have put on that list is Soul Craft by Bill Plotkin, which is the what happens when you're out in so-called nature for multiple days and you start to transform and heal. And Sunlight, Red Light. So like categories couldn't make it onto the list because we had to do so much with only 10, which is why it's a, a fun project. But talk me through some of yours, Greg. Well, Turtles All the Way Down is a great book. Oh, yeah. You know, that's the quintessential childhood vaccine book. The author wouldn't even put their name on it, apparently, but it's very good. Invisible Rainbow is on my list. Bruce Lipton's Biology of Belief is there. Rob Brown, Dr. Rob Brown is a guy I interviewed. His book, Toxic Home, Conscious Home, isn't necessarily the best book, but it covers areas of toxins in a modern Western home that aren't talked about, like how you can make yourself sick with your cooking practices and your cookware and your corporate candles that you're burning in the air. Yeah. Like yeah. all these, the cleaners in your house. You know, if you want to, have a robust list. Like if you take my approach of like, how do you armor yourself up and be the healthiest person? It'd be a major blind spot to leave out all these things that people think are cleaning products and that kind of stuff that are wrecking their body. So how it's are you on going the runner's with that? list? How, like how you, cause like I, we're doing pretty good. I'm down to making my own mouthwash at the moment, mm -hmm. right? The, the boss level for me, which I haven't got to, and I will hopefully get to in Q4, is giving up shampoo. Ah. <laughs> like, because, yeah. And I'm, I'm just giving up hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whilst they've got it. Yeah. Yeah. How uh, are you, going? you just moved, right? So you're like in an, a reasonable good opportunity. Like, how am I going with cleaning products and all the rest? Right, of right. And I'm in a partnership where the partner does a lot of the heavy lifting in some of those departments and the natural products never seem to work quite as well. So there is a balancing act there. But I think we're doing pretty, pretty decent. We're still trying to find the best product for everything. But there's a range of products that we use. I can't remember the name of them, but they, they all come in powder form. And then you add water and they're all natural based. And you're not getting all the chemicals and the dyes and the folates, all that stuff they're talking about now, the forever chemicals. So yeah, I think we've weeded out a lot of that stuff from our lives, but you know, we could still do better, but it is one of those things where you start chasing it and obsessing over it. And it's like, look, you're doing better than 80% of people exactly. just chill. That's going to be good enough. When you factor in the EMF environment is better than most people, the diet, you know, we strictly eat organic, of course. Yeah. And those options aren't as prevalent here in Florida as they were in California. If California does one thing right, people care about what they put in their body. And, you know, the rest of the country gives California a lot of shit about their avocado toast and bull, all that yeah. stuff. But, you know, it is important. I'm and toast with the side of mRNA. You like, <laughs> they care about what they 
anybody through the mouth. Oh, yeah, yeah, fair. <laughs> through, through one orifice only. One, yeah. this orifice, they care a lot. But also dirty electricity, Dr. Sam Milham, important. It covers EMF, but other things that we don't often think about. One book that is on this list that's just too specific but is so important is The Great Prostate Hoax, How Big Medicine Hijacked the PSA Test and Caused a Public Health Disaster by Dr. Richard Ablin. We were very close to recording an interview, and then the pandemic happened, and I was like, well, I'm doing all these other medical shows. I don't know if I'm going to do this. But he basically exposes the fact that with the prostate test, the prostate cancer test, it is this chemical that they're testing. And it is the amount of this chemical they can detect in your prostate. And if you go above the threshold, the magic number, then you got prostate cancer. And now you got to go through the treatments and probably get it removed. He exposes this as irrelevant. This chemical has nothing to do with if you have cancer or not, or if you're about to get cancer, it's just a number. It's just a a chemical in your body that goes up and down occasionally, and there's really no relationship. And that's important because then you start asking about other forms of cancer and you start thinking about how the whole industry is all about what? Got to get tested. Got to get the fingers up the ass. Got to go get your breast squeezed. Got to go. You got to get constantly tested. All these body parts, you know, If you're above 45, you better get in there and get a test. Why? Because you're probably fine, but you might pop positive on one of these damn tests. And now they're cutting out a piece of your body. So that book is very specific, but it opens the gateway to thinking about other cancer detection techniques and what might really be going on there. Well, and everything detection techniques, right? Like that's the story of of testing inside um, an alpine. And this is you, you learn this in Celia Farber's book when they the testing they did to allegedly isolate the HIV virus. The patients who had AIDS that they took it out of, less than half of them had, and this is the thing, the antibody to, <laughs> to what they were looking for. They never found the actual thing. And in all other so called viruses, the antibodies show that you don't have it, but in this one, it shows that you do. And it wasn't even in all the people. So somehow you could get to full-blown AIDS, 80s AIDS, without this little particle that they also didn't test for. But if you go, because this is, you know, gay business, but if you go and get your regular HIV test and you have the flu or a hungover or pregnant, less likely, but it can happen, much more likely to have whatever these chemical indicators are that we are associating with a so-called antibody to a so-called particle, and you're fucked at that point mm-hmm. because you can't be like, I don't know, I refuse treatment. It's like, well, we're going to tell your insurer that you are now in this category called HIV positive, that all this stuff happens, which is what happened with the Western blood test in Africa. It's insane. It's completely. Yeah. And people will hear their own thing. They're like, oh, super, so don't get prostate cancer. It's like, oh, just sit down. Oh, my God. Right. Not- <laughs> right. And But there is some insidiousness to the system because if you, let's say you pop positive for this test and then don't actually have it, but they cut out your prostate, they'll tell you you're a survivor. And now yeah. you're a statistic on this, this metric that the cancer industry is saving a lot of lives and you're one of them. And it's like, no, you didn't have a problem you thought you had. And obviously people get cancer, but Chemotherapy kills a lot of people too. Yeah, and you, some some reports say that can't can, like. I reckon what is it? Fifty percent of people more are going to get a cancer diagnosis at least, right? And a cancer diagnosis in allopathy is you have now somehow got cells that are going out of control, which is really surprising. Again, it comes from this machine model understanding of of what's going on that, oh, it's out of control and we know better. And as a result of knowing better, we're going to irradiate you and cut bits of you out because we know better than your body, which is a meat robot that is an idiot. Mm -hmm. You need a metaphysics of cancer before you go on one of those potential health journeys. And cancer in the new biology of water, again, Dr. Tom Cowan, is one of them, which is like, it's the cancer that becomes, dare I say, fatal, although we don't have good numbers on this because of how we treat it is actually the body's inability to complete a cancer process. Like you don't have cancer. Like that's the body doing a thing it knows how to do. When it starts to risk life, it's because there's either too many toxins or, do you know what I mean? Like it's actually the process not completing. We say have cancer 
but everyone has cancer cells. Everyone at any time you have cells that would satisfy that definition because it's the body in the process of moving things out of you. When it becomes a health crisis is when part of that process is interrupted, you know? Mm -hmm. It's terrifying yeah. because you can just go like, carry on. Sometimes yes. it goes away on its own, but it's a better way to say that it's part of a process. And when the process is detected at like certain stages, then they're like, well, we got to, you basically take a fork in the road and you go down the big pharma route and then they start doing all this stuff to you. And then again, if you do die, they're like, well, the cancer, it was stage four, it, it got them. It's like, well, do yeah. we know that? Or is it the poison you were pumping into them? Exactly. Yeah. Curious question, I mean, but that that's a good, yeah. unique book that operates in a, in a really specific area that no other real book on my list or runner's up list touches. But, you know, I got Altered Genes, Twisted Truth, the quintessential GMO book, Virus Mania, which was on the conspiracy list. Sane Asylums by Jerry Cantor, who we both had on. A really interesting look at homeopathy and psychiatry in a weird chapter that we don't talk about much. Murder by Inject Injection is a great book about the AMA. And Unsavory Truth, Marion Nessel, she wrote about, she writes about the food companies and the junk science they put out and how the junk science works with the food company marketing. And that stuff's all interesting and important. But if you avoid processed foods, it's irrelevant to you. You just know that you, that a lot of that stuff is bullshit and you just avoid it. So that, you know, got kicked down the list, but also cancer and the new biology of water, Tom Cowan, another great Tom Cowan book. But these are the things that didn't make my list because I just didn't think they were actionable. And they're more about problems and things to avoid, but they're all important. They're all really good. Yeah. I think this is our best combined list so far, right? Like if you, if you get through this whole list, you're in, you're in a good spot, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got to take right, the so advice too. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's kind of where I want to bring the show to uh, an end. And it's it, the obvious question. I'm going to ask you it, but I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tee up, which is if people could do one thing, what would that be? And I'm going to go first so that I don't trick you into saying like maybe water or something. And I'm reminded of something that Catherine Austin Fitz says all the time, which is like, what's the most important component to health? And she was told by one of her friends, Grace, because when you look at what we're going through, if it wasn't for grace, we'd all be dead by now. Mm. And I think that's really powerful. When you're looking at Jesus, this is overwhelming. We got 5G everywhere. Like the food is terrible. Inflation's terrible and all the rest of it. Alberto Vialdo says the same thing. Like what's the one best dietary intervention you can do? And he says, bless your food. So my one thing to do is like, don't despair. and um, situate yourself with that like grace blessing level first in all areas like house cleaning diet sunlight and so on sit get yourself under that grace however you see or experience it and don't think you're failing if you haven't done a hundred percent of what's in breath or if every single cleaning product isn't handmade by vestal virgins at an astrologically elected <laughs> hour and and so on just like the so much of that healing value, the 80% of it comes in that first 20% of everything, right? People listening to this, or I would be halfway through that journey at least, right? But just don't, just don't be overwhelmed. Do the best you can in every category. And you are just, you know, you're in a much better position, unfortunately, than many of our fellow humans. Yeah, what do you think? I, what do you, what's like, how do you put it all together? What's like the one thing you tell people who've suddenly woken up to like, oh my God, yeah, <laughs> everything's I mean, terrible. <laughs> grace in a word is really, really good. And it's advice I should take myself because I do get really up in my head about not being absolutely perfect on so many of these things. But I actually got sick a few weeks ago for 48 hours. It was a really bad one too. And I just got so mad at myself. Like, what the fuck did I not do right? Why am I sick right now? What the hell is this about? Like, I do better than so many other people I know. Why isn't my buddy Mike sick? Mike eats like trash. 
Darrell eats from 7-Eleven every day. What the fuck's going on? Why isn't he sick? You know, I, I get mad at myself in those moments, but I think we just don't know. Maybe it's a, a natural detoxification process that has to happen. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It's a defense mechanism for an unavoidable toxins that will enter your life at some point. But uh, when you first asked, mindset is really what came to mind because mindset is broad enough to cover grace. Yep. It also covers having just a, a positive attitude about things. It covers managing your mental stress level. It covers that mind over medicine area. And it is weird. I mean, but it, we're also on rune soup. So it's not a materialist world. It's not necessarily about what diet is, is right. Things fundamentally are non-physical and it should start there. And so I would agree that mindset is probably the, the best thing you can do is ma maintain that, manage that. And it's more easily managed when you know you're doing pretty good in a lot of these other categories. Like yeah. it, it helps as like a kind of a training wheel to keep your mind state in a positive place. Nice one. All right. Well, I think, I think we've, we've put people in that mindset and, <laughs> and they should be experiencing that grace. It doesn't work quite as well. But once again, really, really good, fun installment of the, yeah, the world's least likely book club. And yeah, I mean, what else you got going on? Tell us things about, tell us things about life, Florida, man. What, what do you got coming up in your, in your world? Man, well, you know, I have kid number two coming in the next 30 days or so. And that's crazy because it's just hard to imagine doing everything we just did with also a toddler. I don't know how they're going to sleep at the same time. Like these sorts of things. When one's crying, how's the other one going to sleep? It gets done. I know that I'm in the minority being an only child. Most families are at least two. They used to be more like nine. So it gets done. People do make it through, but that is a looming situation. But as for the move, I mean, the move has been excellent. I like the, the house. I like the property. I like some of the people that I've met so far. I like the lusciousness of, of things here. Everything is wet and green. And there's a lot of biodiversity and we see all kinds of animals and birds on the property that like we wouldn't have seen before. Even just saying I have a property is, is fun. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, people talk a lot of shit about the Florida man and like this trailer swamp person archetype, which exists. <laughs> it does. But I, I kind of think that it's just like, if you dig a bit deeper, it is really a, a really super unique environment for the world and the United States. And I like the fact that we have these crazy thunderstorms that last 40 minutes and then they're gone. And it's just like weather patterns move through this place really quickly. And, and it's just new to me. I mean, back in Missouri, it's a rainy day or it's a sunny day. It's not going to be both uh, every three hours. San Diego is just a flat 75 and sunny all the time. So I, I like the change. I wish they did do better about food out here. They just don't seem to care. I think it's because there's a lot of bugs. So people use pesticides and they use yeah. terms like local and fresh, but they never use organic and pesticide free. That's a bit of a problem, but plenty of resiliency in the local food growing community. If you can overlook that or try to re-educate people on that one particular issue. But there's a lot to like. There's a lot to like mm -hmm. politically and economically and just now really getting the footing, but it's fun. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I'm very excited for you, as you know. I've always been, well, since I first ever went there, pro Florida. So I'm I'm glad you're embarking on this adventure and double teaming it with a looming additional parenting adventure so yeah we don't have a good name yeah. for the second one whatever it is we wasted our good name that's true that's true it'll probably be just cedric i don't know we didn't get this right yeah yeah theory and and megan yes <laughs> theory and dave uh, like, yeah dave or jane right just yeah eat jane yeah i like it all right. Well, again, thanks so much. Really enlightening chat. Really great list. And I guess see you in the next whatever this one is.
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And these lists have been really fun. I'm glad we got three under our belts. I don't know where we can go from here, but I'm going to think long and hard and try to come up with a good one. Yeah. Top 10 baby names. All right. There we go. <laughs> See you. Peace.